All right. Our recording has started and uh, we can begin. I would like to request uh, one of us to please lead in prayer this morning. Okay, anybody volunteering to pray? I'll pray first. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this morning. Thank you for uh, this day, God. I pray, Lord, that today uh, you would have your way, God. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done in our lives, God. Lord, um, as uh, Pastor Nancy uh, teaches us your word, God, I pray that we would uh, uh, hear your word and that we would uh, apply it in our daily lives god and learn and learn more about you and uh, practice it um every day god um thank you for uh anointing pastor Nancy and giving her the uh words to say and giving her uh, wisdom lord uh, and for your grace um pray for each student here um i pray that we would learn and that we would grow um in the knowledge and uh, um of who you are, God. Have your way in us, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kung. Uh, we will get started from where we had stopped in the last class. We um, saw how the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts. And then, you know, we um, uh, saw that when this great noise came through from the upper room that people had gathered and we could uh, notice people from at least 15 different communities who came and who heard uh, praises of God in their own language and then you know Peter stands up to explain the phenomenon and he quotes uh, from prophet Joel and he lets the people know that this is what the prophet Joel had spoken uh, about and we know that it looked quite different from what uh, the prophet Joel had mentioned because he had enlisted dreams visions prophecy and things like that but uh, in this particular happening it was an unknown language which people were speaking but by the holy spirit he was able to tell that this was the work of the holy spirit uh, and the people who observed it we noticed they had two responses one was that of uh, honoring god uh, the other one was that of mocking these people so, you know, Peter uh, begins to explain further. We saw how he made his sermon, right? He uh, made his sermon. Uh, he first talked about this being a work of God. And then, you know, he goes on to talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is Peter's first sermon. And, uh, you know, he uh, uh, quotes from the Old Testament. We had uh, gone over this sermon somewhat quickly, uh, but uh, you know, I'll just take some time today to uh, explain it better to all of us. So, although we stopped somewhere, you know, at, at the place where um, Peter talked about Jesus being greater than David, uh, I'll just you know go to some, some of the scriptures which are earlier and start from there. So uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. Let's, let's go back there. Yes. So we said that, you know, Peter um, talked about the prophecy of Joel. Now in verse 21, I want you to notice this. Um, from this time onwards, you know, after the Holy Spirit has been poured out, um, well, not exactly this moment, but the last days. And I explained to us the last days are uh, once Jesus was able to uh, perform that sacrifice that uh, God had sent him to make. So that 
is when the last days begin. From then on, what did Jesus do? He opened up the way for the Gentiles as well. But up until then, he was going to the children of the covenant, which is uh, the uh, you know the the children of israel but after his sacrifice it was open to all so verse 21 here uh you know peter reiterates that and he says and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved so this is something for us to uh take notice of because uh this would not have been possible but for the sacrifice of Jesus and something has shifted and so in the book of Acts uh, till, till uh, the Gospels we see that Jesus insisted that he must minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel but from the book of acts you no know, this is changing so the gospel is actually according to the great commission going to uh, all communities all tribes all nations so there is no restriction you know, as far as the community is concerned so that is why you know peter uh, says that whoever calls on the name of the lord and that is a great encouragement and brings great hope to our hearts okay and uh going forward we see here that uh, you know peter begins to share the gospel uh another thing that we have to take notice of is that he quotes from the old testament because He's talking to a Jewish audience and he knew that they will honor his message if it is related to the scriptures. So there are uh, certain passages that he goes back to. Initially, he quoted from Joel chapter 2 uh, verses 28 to 32. Then uh, in the rest of what he shares, he quotes from Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. He also quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1, as we go forward. So now he uh, begins to talk about Jesus of Nazareth. And I remember telling all of us that, you know, Peter was so bold. We see a completely different man here uh, compared to the one who denied Christ in his uh, crucial moments. So Peter is very bold and he talks about Jesus of Nazareth because at this point he was a controversial figure to uh, the, the people anyway because uh, less than two months ago he had been crucified and uh, a, a lot of confusion existed around his death and later you know when people started uh, uh, saying that he rose from the dead it would have been very difficult for the authorities so for Peter to proclaim this Jesus at this point in time was amazing and notice how in verse 22 he says jesus of nazareth okay jesus of nazareth so he uh, is not afraid of being clear in his proclamation and then he talks about jesus of nazareth he says that uh, he was attested by god now again it's all very uh, uh, scary to make statements like this in such an environment because the people had chosen to, uh, uh, you know, he, Jesus was convicted by the authorities. But Peter is saying he was attested by God or approved by God through the works that he did miracles, wonders, and signs. So uh, it was indeed bold of Peter to do this, that he shares the rest of what uh, happened to Jesus. Verse 23, he says, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. So again, it's amazing. Uh, the people chose to do something but god was still able to fulfill his plan and purpose so it's it's a, a way in which god's purposes are accomplished you know uh, despite uh, despite the lack of cooperation from uh, mankind in this case people chose to uh, kill him uh, but 
God's great plan and design that Jesus will become that redemption lamb for us, it was still fulfilled. So in God's foreknowledge, God knew that Jesus will make a sacrifice and he also knew that the people will be uh, unwilling and uh, they will not be supportive, yet God was able to fulfill his purpose. Uh, and so Jesus was crucified and you see, he was put to death. Till that point, it was easy for the people to receive. But verse 24, Peter says, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So all these statements were uh, very bold of Peter to make at that point, because there was still speculation about this event of resurrection. For the Jews, we know in the Gospels, we read that they, uh, the people who were guarding the uh, tomb of Jesus were uh, told to inform the people that his body was stolen by the disciples. So there must have been speculation that Peter and his friends have stolen the body of Jesus. Now, with all this uh, in the air, Peter clearly tells them, God raised up. So he is affirming the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, And he says it's God who raised him. So God loosed the pains of death. And God is the one who brought him out of that tomb. Uh, and he quotes David here. He says, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. So he's talking about Yahweh God whom they worship. And let's see what else David says. He says, therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. So it's a prophetic psalm. Uh, David is speaking as if this concerns him, as if God will not let his soul rest in Hades or hell. Uh, but, you know, Peter wanted to clarify to the Jews that though David seemed to be speaking of uh, himself in Hades, that God will not leave him in Hades, uh, that they needed to note that it's actually Jesus Christ who's being spoken of and that God raised him from the dead. So resurrection would have been a very hard thing for the uh, onlook onlookers to accept. So he is giving a clarification from scripture. So in verse 29, he says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So, you know, he is making it plain and clear and saying, Look what David said. He said that God will not let him, uh, his flesh or his soul remain in Hades. But what do we know as a fact, you know, uh, uh, right now? He is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. So he is explaining that these lines are not about David. Further, verse 30, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. So he is uh, pointing to the fact that David had a promise that through his lineage will come uh, you know, somebody who will sit on the throne. So David's, there, there will be a descendant on the throne at all times. And that would be the Christ. Then verse 31, 
he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the christ that his soul was not left in hades nor did his flesh see corruption so he say this was actually spoken about the christ verse 32 this jesus god has raised up of which we are all witnesses so he clarified that it's only the christ what is christ christ is a title okay christ is a savior was the name of jesus jesus christ no his name was jesus and he was probably identified as jesus of nazareth okay so that was the identity of jesus but christ is a title given to the one who would save the people so peter explains that it is only possible for the christ to rise from the dead and then you know he uh, associates jesus and says this jesus who is this jesus the same jesus who was crucified okay not too long ago this jesus god has raised up so do you see the connection here the christ is to resurrect but this jesus god raised up and he says we are all witnesses to that we have seen it we have uh you know we we uh, can confirm it to you we are all witnesses of what god has done and verse 33 therefore being exalted to the right hand of god and having received from the father the promise of the holy spirit he poured out this which you now see and hear so he is he just gave witness to what the resurrection of jesus okay by quoting old testament scriptures by quoting uh, the patriarch david so some of these men of the old testament were known as patriarchs you know they were great men of faith and their you know uh, uh, lineages gave birth to other men mighty men of faith so they were uh, well respected so using all this he still proclaimed that scriptures talk about a christ who cannot be held by death and you no know, he points out how the lord jesus is the one who has risen and he fits into this explanation about the christ he also says we have witnessed him okay so resurrection is proclaimed by peter the, he proclaims one more aspect about uh, jesus which is his ascension so he says therefore being exalted to the right hand of god okay all these things are not possible by a mere human but it is only possible by uh, the son of god so jesus ascended up you know in his resurrected body to the right hand of god and he says he was received up by the father and the promise of the holy spirit he poured out uh, this which you now see and hear so so far we have seen the explanation you know which uh, peter gave about basically the phenomenon which was observed by the people but more about uh, the reason for this phenomenon which is the lord jesus the fact that he is deity the fact that he has proven his deity you know through the uh, uh, death the uh, burial resurrection and ascension so let me just pause here for a moment and uh, uh, talk to all of you i hope you're all doing fine uh, do you have any thoughts at this point any comments or questions we shall take that up and then proceed further Any other observations in uh, Peter's sermon, of Peter's sermon?
Uh, yes, uh, Kennedy, please go ahead. What I'm asking, eh? Yeah. Upon the death of Jesus, where did he go to? Upon the death of Jesus. Okay, yeah. so uh, I think it's the book of Ephesians where there's an explanation of how you know, Jesus went to the depths of hell and he took the keys, right, of death. And uh, yeah, he came out having taken those keys. That's where he was. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So we also recognize, uh, you know, from this passage that he went there to because uh, you know uh, at that time you had a hell which was uh, according to you know their understanding the people of Jesus' times it was known as Hades and it had this whole partition uh, uh, where you had one section where uh, it was known as paradise or Abraham's bosom and those who uh, were you know those who believed in God, like they, they were all uh, in that place. So they were all, uh, you know, released. And from that point on, we only have heaven and hell. So we don't have uh, what is known as paradise anymore. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So Jesus went down to Hades. Uh, he went and he took the keys of death and he came back. So that's what happened when he had died. Yes, uh, Sarupa, you have something to say? Okay, it seems like, uh, yeah, Sister Rupa, you're back. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. So, uh, wrong touch. No uh, problem. Uh, um, you were asking about any point to be added to Peter's sermon. Uh, I just uh, remembered that the Joel prophecy has started when uh, Peter was preaching and it will. it is continuing and it will reach its completion in the end days, I believe, because the whole prophecy is not fulfilled on that time, but it is a continuous process and it will be completely fulfilled in the last days and we should be ready and uh, prepared to receive it. That's what I, I just wanted to add, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for that. That's a very good observation. Uh, while Peter was able to say that, you know, this is that, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, uh, which was spoken of by Joel, uh, Sirupa is very right. It was just the beginning and the last days continue right now um, till Jesus returns. So the work of the Holy Spirit and the, um, you know, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and these are all things uh, that are continuing to unfold even now. And the fulfillment uh, as such is not yet done. So, or it's not complete. Okay, so um, it, it is uh, the spirit is being poured out, and uh, many manifestations, you know, are being recognized. So that is correct, uh, Stupa. Thank you for that. Any other observations? Okay, how about uh, this? Uh, an observation, uh, you know, that that I made is how Peter makes use of the opportunity. He realizes that people have a question, you know, when they when they uh, hear that sound. So he makes an explanation for that. But notice how he brings in the gospel. He brings in the proclamation of the Lord Jesus and who he really is. Okay, so that is preaching the gospel. So he made use of the opportunity to invite people to, uh, you know, repent, invite people to uh, give their lives to the Savior. So uh, the proclamation of the gospel, uh, even at a time when Peter was only meant, you know, to give an explanation for what was going on. He doesn't waste the opportunity, but he makes sure that he preaches the gospel. Okay, so 
that's something that uh, really touched me. Okay, anything else that you have noticed? Okay, so we'll uh, go further and uh, you know let let's see what else uh, happens in Acts chapter two. So so far we've seen uh, Peter's sermon. Uh, he's addressing the crowd that had gathered. Uh, he has spoken about Jesus and he has uh, talked of his uh, resurrection and ascension till now. So verse thirty four. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, again, you know, Peter is clarifying that uh, David is not the one who resurrected from the dead. So he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So the Lord here refers to Yahweh you know, the, the uh, God of the Jews. So they could understand that. Said to my Lord, it's very interesting because David, introduced by Peter here, is a prophet. Okay, So David, as a prophet, spoke these things. So in his prophetic word, David was, ref David was actually referring to the Lord Jesus. So Jesus is his Lord. He said it in his prophetic message. The Lord, Yahweh God, said to my Lord, my Lord, the Lord Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So it's amazing how the Holy Spirit gave Peter the wisdom to preach such a message based on scripture. Now, who is Peter? Already the Jews who had gathered said, oh, these Galileans, they are not learned people. These Galileans, they are not good orators. And to add to that, what are, what are Peter's credentials? You know, cowardly, uh, uh, he's a fisherman, okay? Uh, so speaks before he thinks. So many challenges with Peter, but here he is filled with the Holy Spirit, standing up in boldness and wisdom to proclaim the Lord Jesus, while he provides an explanation to the phenomenon. So it's really powerful what Peter was able to do that day. But we know for a fact that it was not Peter uh, just by himself, but it was the work of the Holy Spirit through Peter that caused him to uh, speak such a powerful sermon. Okay, uh, and uh, to add to this, you know, it was unprepared. He had no idea that he will have to preach a long message like this, you know, on that day of Pentecost. Because how did the day of Pentecost come? And suddenly, yet, you know, we're talking about this beautiful sermon that Peter preached unprepared. Now, let's go forward. Verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So very bold of Peter to speak in this way of the Lord Jesus. Again, he's not afraid to point to this Jesus so that the people are not confused that He's talking about some other Jesus. And he boldly says, this Jesus whom you crucified, what has God done? He has made him both Lord and Christ. So he is God, he is deity, he is a Messiah. So the message of Peter was bold and clear. Very, very clear. Verse 37. Now, when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, 
what shall we do so a message preached in the power of the holy spirit it has a response it has a you know a powerful message has a powerful response what is that response the onlookers they were cut to the heart what is cut to the heart cut to the heart is the conviction of the holy spirit which came upon the listeners we know from uh, scripture that the holy spirit does his work you know of of helping people of convicting people of sin righteousness and of judgment so he brings them to the realization of these things so as peter proclaimed the message the holy spirit was working together with him and people were scripture say cut to the heart or they were convicted when they heard this and whenever conviction comes upon people you know our responsibility is to uh, guide them on what they need to do now when people are convicted you know uh, about their sin and people are convinced about the uh, deity of the lord jesus christ that he is the messiah we need to call them to repentance and the steps that follow repentance and that's exactly what peter did uh, but very beautiful in verse 37 that the the large gathering they the cut to the heart they were convicted and you know they said men and brethren what shall we do so how many times do we see this kind of a response that people hear what we say and they want to respond right they 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 want to do something uh, to make it right with god so it was a very effective sermon which peter preached going to verse 38 here then peter said to them repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit so peter is very clear in what needs to be done so he says repent that's what you need to do if you are convicted by my message repent john the baptist preached repent you know for the kingdom of god is at hand what did jesus preach same message repent get right with god and here is peter being filled with the holy spirit he also says repent you know turn from your wicked ways get right with god and let every one of you be baptized in the name of jesus christ so once you have repented you have to uh, uh you know this is a public proclamation that you made this decision of repenting of your sins and walking with the lord jesus so he says uh, be baptized so baptism is that it's a public proclamation of our decision so he says be baptized be baptized in what name so that they don't get confused you know about the baptism of uh, john the baptist he says be baptized in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins and what else in addition to that there is a beautiful promise that you will receive which they had just received the baptism in the holy spirit so he says you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit verse 39 for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the lord our god will call now this particular uh, verse here 39 gives incredible hope to us why because in the early church which is uh, you know what is being formed in acts chapter 2 so many people like to title acts chapter 2 as the birth of the early church okay so the church is being birthed here and peter is telling the believers that you will receive the promise of the holy spirit but it's the great news in this is that this promise will not stop just with you you will receive it but who else will receive it the promise is to you and to your children 
So their descendants, their generations who believe will also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And who else? Says, and to all who are afar off, which includes you and I. So it includes our generation today. And that is what Peter was saying 2,000 years ago. He was saying that everyone who believes, repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And anyone who believes, you know, even after... We have believed, we go and proclaim the gospel, people turn to the Lord. Everyone who believes has this portion to receive. What is it? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it says, as many as the Lord our God will call. So the promise is very valid for all of us today. So I just want to pause. Any thoughts, any questions right now? about Peter's message, the parts of Peter's message, the response of the people. OK, so a very powerful sermon uh, over there. And I wish you know we, we could have witnessed it. But thank God, you know, the Holy Spirit has recorded this beautiful sermon for us. Now, let's continue. Verse 40, it says, And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So it simply tells us that what we have read so far, what Luke has recorded so far, it's a shortened version of Peter's sermon. Would he have included other passages, other explanations? Maybe he would have done that. But whatever was necessary has been put out here by Luke for us. So in all these ways, what did uh, Peter do? He testified. He exhorted. Exhortation is uh, like gently, you know, encouraging, nudging people. That's what it is to do the right thing. So he was testifying. He was exhorting them uh, to be saved, to uh, follow God, you know, to in other words, be born again. In verse 41, it says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. It's nothing less than miraculous. I mean, just think about it. You know, uh, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he preached this message. Uh, and in those days, you know, I, I, I'm sure they probably had a, you know, good oratory style and all those skills to be able to communicate their message to the audience. But uh, they may not have had the aid that we have today. You know, we have technology, we have PowerPoint, we have, uh, you know, talk about it, any kind of audiovisual aid, everything that we have. But what made the message of Peter so effective, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So it was a very effective message. Response, people were convicted. And what else happens? We are told that they gladly received his word. And those who received were what? Baptized on the same day. How many of them? 3,000 souls were added to them. If we see something like this, you know, we would be amazed. Things like this, we would only expect, okay, in a crusade or uh, in, in, in some sort of uh, revival meeting where 3,000 people have accepted Christ and they are baptized on the same day. So uh, sometimes the book of Acts, you know, is referred to as the revival in the early church because you see the uh, the wonderful things that are happening here uh, it's it's kind of you know uh, amazing uh, as we grasp uh, 
you know what is actually unfolding here so 3000 people being saved 3000 being people being baptized uh, what about those 120 people who were baptized in the holy spirit they would all have instantly become volunteers because there is no option now Peter preached the message and you know you have people who have accepted the message uh, and they need baptism we don't know how many of them actually helped in baptizing these people in the nearby water bodies. All we know is that in one day, so much of work had been done. 3,000 people had been baptized. So the 120 people would have been so busy you know, getting all this done. What a mighty revival you know, that broke uh, into the early church. So this is how the birth of the church started. You will not see the term church anywhere uh, uh, right now. Neither will you see the term Christians. Okay. So this is the formation of the early church uh, and the people of God uh, that you know, is taking place in Acts chapter 2. So now 3,000 people have been baptized. What happens next? Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So what happened? What should we do when people are born again, when there are, uh, you know, new believers in Christ Jesus? Do we just, uh, you know, praise God about it, make a report about it and then forget about it? No, that's not how the uh, apostles and the initial volunteers in the church did ministry what did they do they made sure that these people continue strong in god so when people are born again through our ministry we shouldn't let them you know just oh just go be happy you're not born you're now born again it's all wonderful no we don't do that instead we see how we can invest in their lives uh, so that they can continue how steadfastly or in a firm way in an anchored way in a strong way they can continue in god so what are some of the things that help uh, people continue in god this is not a you know a complete list but of course, it is a good list nonetheless. Uh, we see that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. So doctrine or the word of God is very important to help people continue firmly in him. So what is apostles' doctrine? Apostles' doctrine is the truth which the apostles proclaimed. What would they have proclaimed? They would have proclaimed the scriptures that Jesus honored. Now we know that Jesus was committed to the scriptures of the uh, Old Testament. You know, the Jewish people at that time, the Torah. So different things that Jesus honored, those scriptures, the apostles honored, obviously. So they would have taught from that. But in addition to the scriptures that Jesus honored, they would also have taught the teachings of Jesus. So that makes up, makes up apostles' doctrine. So that is what they would have taught to these early believers. So see, it's very simple. You know, in the Great Commission, what did Jesus say? Go make disciples of all nations. Uh, yes, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but also what? Teaching them to observe isn't it so whatever you have been taught you teach it to the others and that is what they were doing so they taught them everything they knew which is termed here as the apostles doctrine so that is one second uh, a second is fellowship fellowship uh, so for the people to remain strong gathering together was necessary gathering together coming together associating community we have different terms for this that was important so they encouraged the fellowship of the believers and that also kept them strong in god next in the breaking of bread breaking of bread is what communion they saw jesus do that uh, in in the uh, uh, you know in the supper and 
they follow the same thing why because jesus said do this in remembrance of me so what were they actually accomplishing by breaking the bread they were remembering the sacrifice of jesus so the community of the believers should never forget the sacrifice of jesus that is why communion was instituted and communion is something that the early church is uh, you know practicing and you see that here then what else in prayers so these were some basics that the uh, first set of believers were trained in the apostles doctrine fellowship breaking of bread and in prayers so uh, in this manner they were kept strong in the work of god uh, and encouraged in the lord so what are we seeing we're seeing okay people are saved 3000 people are saved and the church is now being you know the way we understand the church is being built up the people are being built up who is the church the people so the people are being built up and strengthened verse 43 then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles so what else is happening you see that the gathering of believers the community of believers um, is is being recognized uh, as you know blessed by god so what's happening fear came upon every soul so there is a respect there is an honor uh, which people have towards the uh, people of God, the apostles, and also the breaking out of the supernatural. And that's why I said, you know, the book of Acts, it's revival, revival which broke out after the ascension of the Lord Jesus and after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So uh, when these you know, supernatural things started happening. Verse 44 says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And verse 45, And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So uh, the community was a strong and strong and a well knit community. In this case, we see that it was also a giving community, a sharing community, a loving community. Uh, they were taking care of each other to the extent that they even sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had needs. So uh, why is this taking place? Because please understand that during the festival of Pentecost, people, devout brethren had come from other regions. Uh, around Jerusalem and once they heard the message of the Lord Jesus it is possible that some of them did not go back so they decided to stay on with the apostles they did not have work there jobs there so while there were people who were well settled in Jerusalem there must have also been people who had nothing to continue in Jerusalem and uh, which is why this whole um, uh, you know hospitality and sharing aspect comes into the community of believers so we don't see this everywhere and for us to you know apply it or impose it on on every believing community and say no you have to give to the extent that you sell your possessions would not be you know right it won't be applicable uh, this was because of the circumstances that the early church was in at that time that people even had to meet others needs by selling their own uh, things okay so uh, this is how the early church is is uh, growing and we will see more uh, in the next session we'll take a break for now if you have any questions, please hold on to them or you could uh, post it on the chat. We'll come back. You can answer those questions and continue. So let's go in for a break uh, and uh, we'll see each other in 10, 10 minutes. Thank you.